Time magazine. The mystery of how the first white skin appeared in human beings might have been solved. It's thanks to research carried out on the humble zebrafish. Cancer researchers at the Penn State College of Medicine say their work shows that a chance genetic mutation thousands of years ago in the first humans who had black skin is responsible for the evolution of white skin. The genetic, the genetic determination of human skin color had previously been unclear. Keith Cheng is associate professor at Penn State and heads the team that made the discovery. Hello there, Professor Cheng. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Just um, describe for me what you found. Well, we found a... Uh that this light-colored zebrafish that we were using for our cancer research um, remarkably had these uh, changes that differentiated from the darker uh, originating strain um, uh, in a way that was similar to the changes that we see in human beings. And uh, that led us to the idea that maybe this gene might be important, and lo and behold, it turned out to be. So I guess the most important thing is not only did we find a new gene involved in pigmentation, which had not been identified be before, but that a difference in this particular gene, that uh, it's only one letter change out of three billion in our instruction book of life, our DNA, is, uh, seems to be responsible for the lighter skin color of the European branch of humanity. So just take us a little bit back in time to the, um, the first human beings. What were they like and what do we know about their skin color? Well, we know from the comparing the sequence of this gene, which is very, very highly conserved across evolution, particularly all vertebrates, um, we know that this gene is functionally conserved because we've actually shown that the gene, the human gene, can actually function in the zebrafish. Um, but then um, we've also shown that uh, the original uh, African, and uh, this is uh, something shared with Asians. So um, anyway, I'll explain that later. Um, the original color was that of the African, so dark, and that's explained by the fact that we had so much sunlight in Africa that uh, it would be difficult to survive down there with light skin. So then, uh, what I'm unclear about is the, is, the mo is the move from that to the establishment of a white skin population that's now in um, Northern Europe. Right, so um, we don't really know exactly what happened because we weren't there, right? So, but um, <laughs> on the other hand, we do know that we need vitamin D to live. We get rickets otherwise. And we also know that if you have a lot of pigment in your skin, like Africans do, if you try to live in Scandinavia, you're in big trouble. You can't make vitamin D, and you will get rickets. So uh, whether the mutation was already present in a rare form um, in Africa, and you just didn't do well if you became homozygous for that, or if the mutation arose newly as uh, people uh, went further north, we don't know. But we do know that it certainly helped Europeans survive up there, and that right now, if you moved to Australia, for example, it's not so favorable anymore. You know, it's strange because Australia is as hot as it is, and yet you have a, a, a white-skinned people that live there. They migrated there, and uh, as you may know, it's illegal to go out and play in the playground if you don't wear a hat now, if you're uh, pale-skinned. Uh, yeah, so why is, this, why is the finding uh, you've made, why is it so important? Well, I think one of the insights that it provides that's so remarkable is that um, in human history, this skin color thing has been so important, uh, it's been the basis of a lot of injustice, and it's due to this, this one um, single letter change in our genome. It should make us pause to think about that. This, uh, as far as we can tell, there's no evidence that uh, affects anything other than skin color, and specifically by just modulating the uh, number, size, and density of these little pigment packets in our pigment cells. What I find interesting, just to finish off, is that the role of um, genetics in race has historically always been a difficult one to debate. So how has your research been viewed um, politically, and what kind of interest has there been? Well, there's been a lot of interest in it. Uh, let me point out that race is a very uh, confused term. It's used mostly in a negative sense, and we should, we're beginning to use it in a positive one, and it contains two components, the genetic, which is uh, the physical features of our, our bodies, and then there are all sorts of other things that are layered on top that are cultural, and those are definitely not genetic. So this is uh, not by itself a, a, a... What kind of interest has there been? Well, there's been a lot of interest in it. Uh, let me point out that race is a very uh, confused term. It's used mostly in a negative sense, and we should, we're should we beginning to use it in a positive one, and it contains two components, the genetic, which is uh, the physical features of our, our bodies, and then there are all sorts of other things that are layered on top that are cultural, and those are definitely not genetic. So this is uh, not by itself a, a, a race gene, but uh, just a gene that uh, 
contributes to the definition. So d just tell me a little, just to finish off the interest that there's been in terms of your findings in, in the States and how they've been um, viewed. I think it's generally been viewed very positively in terms of the geneticists, which provides us an opportunity to demystify race, we think. And um, I'm hoping personally that uh, it's going to clarify discussion and it seems to have uh, from the interest I've received around the world. Professor Keith Chang, thank you so much. Thank you. You are listening.